Now let's pray first. Our Father, we pray that you'll help us understand this scripture better, that you might speak to us, encourage us, stir us up, give us ears to hear. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to look tonight at the story of the rich man and Lazarus, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story with puzzles in it. One of the questions is, look, why is it here? Um, you can just read it as though Luke has collected lots of really interesting stories and he's put them all together and it's kind of like an anthology of stories, a bit like Aesop's fables. You move from one to the next and they're not connected to each other, they're just a model. And you could read that story like that, but in fact, embedded in a long discussion that Jesus is having with his disciples and with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And it's actually, it's actually connected to the story of the two sons back in chapter 15 that we looked at last week. Because one of these sons, this is in chapter 15, verse 13, we're told wasted or squandered all the wealth of his father in wild living. And the older brother, uh, he reinforced it in verse 13. Uh, 30, squandered all your property. But in chapter 16, verse 1, Jesus carries on some discussion by talking about a man's manager, the manager of a property. A rich man had a manager of his property who was wasting his possessions. So the little theme of wasting possessions, wasting wealth, is carried through into chapter 16. Now we're going to get to the rich man later, but you can see a connection, can't you? Rich people. All right, the, first, the father of the two sons was rich, and the, son, the, the sinner son, uh, he was rich for a little while till he wasted it all. And in chapter 16, we've got another rich man with a manager, and the manager is wasting his money. And he's about to lose his job. This is the beginning of chapter 16. Uh, so he, he uses the opportunity he's got while he's still the manager uh, to get some friends for himself after he loses his job. So he calls in the people who owe his master money, you know the story, he gets them to rewrite their bills uh, so they don't have to pay him so much. And um, the purpose of the exercise is so that, so that they will thank him and welcome him into their houses, because they owe him, after he loses his job. And the moral of the story, well, at least one of the applications of the story, is in chapter 16, verse 9, where Jesus is telling his disciples, I tell you, you should use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now he's talking to his disciples. This is chapter 16, verse 1. But there's another group who's listening. There's a secondary, uh, uh, a kind of in, an included, implied group of listeners who are the Pharisees and the teachers of the Lord. It's still in the setting. He's talking to his disciples, but they're listening in. But this man's using worldly wealth so that in the world got friends who welcome him after he loses his job but Jesus says in verse 9 use worldly wealth so that you will have friends who will welcome you not into their earthly houses but into the heavenly houses into heaven verses 10 and 11 he says this is a matter of trust now the, the, the manager in this story wasn't trustworthy but Jesus is saying and this is six, chapter 16 verse 10 whoever be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much and whatever is and whoever is dishonest with very little would also be dishonest with much so if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth who'll trust you with true riches and if you haven't been trustworthy with someone else's property who will give you property of your own it's a matter of trust with the worldly wealth that god has given you he's telling his disciples this and then another application, verse 13, this is, this is what underlies it. No one can serve two masters, either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. That's fairly obvious. But the point is, you can't serve God and money. So we're back to the question of money and wealth. Now the Pharisees, they've been listening in, verse 14. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And we're told in verse 14 that the Pharisees love money. And they were sneering at Jesus. Sneering is a strong word. So Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's trying to encourage them with some better information about how to live as his disciples. And these Pharisees are sneering at him. 
Is Jesus discouraged again? Last week when we looked at chapter 15, I suggested to you there was good grounds for Jesus to be discouraged. And here again, he's got this group who are just kind of against him. But now we've got a new slant on the story of the two sons in chapter 15. Because the son wasted his, his father's wealth, is now in this part of the story filled with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. There are two groups. Well, they, they love money. Um, whether they're wasting them or just whether they're not trustworthy, that's a question we ought to ask. Now, we need some, to have some sympathy for the Pharisees because they took this thing really seriously. And in the last, uh, this last week or so, I've been reading through the first five books of the Bible, Matthew, uh, not Matthew, what's the first one? Genesis. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I'll tell you what, it's so full of laws. You know this anyway, don't you? And, and if you had that kind of mind and you really wanted to keep them all, you'd really have to put your mind to it. Like, it's, it'd be hard work just to work it out, let alone to actually do it. So these Pharisees, they're taking all this really seriously and they're trying really hard to make sure they keep all the laws and where it's not clear, well, somebody's told them what the, what the thing is. And Jesus says in verse 16, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, John the Baptist, but since then, the good news of the kingdom is being preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. Now, I think one of the possible meanings of this is that it's really difficult to get into the kingdom of God. If you thought the law and the prophets was difficult, this is much more difficult. But, verse 17, it's easy for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen, at least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. The law's still there. And then he's got this little example, I think, what it is, verse 18, about divorce. That's just one of the many things he could have taken out of the law. Here's an example of it. But in fact, the kingdom of God version, the post John the Baptist, the Jesus version of the law is much more difficult than the law that the Pharisees were obeying. This is this is that goes to the heart of the law. You see it in the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew. Difficult to be a Pharisee, much more difficult to enter the kingdom of God because the demands of the kingdom of God go further. They take what the Bible says, the law and the prophets, really seriously. So we come to the rich man in chapter 16, verse 19. What's he going to do with his wealth? Here's another rich man. The Pharisees are rich. The manager, the, the owner of the manager's property, he's rich. Uh, the father in the story is rich. Here's another rich man. Well, verses 19 and 20, he uses it for himself. He's living in splendor. Wonderful clothes, wonderful place, wonderful food. He's managing his wealth better than the dishonest manager, and he's certainly managing his wealth much better than the sinner's son back in chapter 15. But there's a man called Lazarus, and we're told in the 19 and 20 that Lazarus is carried to the gate of the rich man, presumably carried there every day. He's a beggar. He lives somewhere else at night, but he's carried there and laid at the gate, and he would like some of the leftovers, the rubbish that comes from the rich man, but he never got anything. The dogs came and ate it. Some people think that's a good thing. The dogs were showing him some mercy, but probably in the context it's not a good thing. So he's in a very miserable state. But verse 22, they both die. And Lazarus is carried this time, not to the gate, but to the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man is buried, ends up in Hades. Where there's no help, there's no rescue, there's no redress, there's no second chance. What's going on here? This one of those uh, stories of karma. Finally, this is one of those reverse. So the rich man, well, actually, that's what it says, doesn't it? You had a good life, he had a bad life. Now you're having a bad life. He's having a good life. Is that what this story is about? And and more particularly, how did the rich man end up in Hades? Like that is really a surprise, in the way Jesus is, and certainly to the audience, because the impression was, of course, that the rich had the advantage. How does he end up here? And did he not know about 
avoiding Hades? Did he not know about something to do with looking after the poor? That looks like one of the big themes. Well, we'll come back to the rich man in a moment. But the rich man's got some brothers. He's got a family of five brothers. So six of them all together, presumably. And uh, presumably the rich man thought that he didn't know about this and nobody warned him about it. But now he's feeling for his brothers and he thinks they won't know about it and they need to be warned as well. So verse 27, he said to Abraham, please send Lazarus. Now, this is the second time he's asked Abraham to send Lazarus. How do you like this, eh? Is this, cla is this a class thing? What is this? That, that the rich man twice has asked Abraham, you know, send this, send this poor bloke to do something for me. To warn the family. Verse... No, Father Abraham. I'm sorry, verse 29. Um, Abraham replies, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. No. 31. If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, there's something bigger here in this story than just helping the poor man. This is about people's eternal destiny and it's about something to do with paying attention to what God has said to them already the rich man thinks that even though they didn't pay attention to the law and the prophets they might pay attention to someone who comes back from the dead now we know this story very well don't we we talk to people who don't believe and they say you know if God couldn't suddenly appear to me in a flash of lightning or, or actually nowadays if you go and buy the book of the Actually, the number of books at Kurong that says, I spent 10 minutes in heaven, and then I know. I'll refrain my feelings about the rubbish that is written and sold. Would that help? The answer is no, of course not. Well, I'll come back to that. What about Lazarus? What's Lazarus missing in the bosom of Abraham? Well, go back to chapter 16, verse 9. What Lazarus is missing is anyone to welcome and to thank when they come to share the heavenly dwellings with him. Lazarus has got no one to thank. Is that a serious omission for Lazarus? You see, it's welcome you into heaven and they'll say thank you for using your word to heaven or you helped me on earth but there's no one there that Lazarus can thank because nobody helped him nobody used their worldly wealth either to teach him the law and the prophets or to give him some food Lazarus has no one to even not even an untrustworthy servant who's used his worldly goods mischievously the rich man of course didn't even like it at all but Lazarus at least is there in heaven it's an interesting statement isn't it if they don't believe Moses and the prophets they won't believe even if someone rises from the dead now you and I immediately see the flaw in this don't you because we know someone has risen from the dead and has come and preached. Surely that'll convince people, won't it? The resurrection of Jesus, that must be sufficient proof to convince people. Well, what happened when the gospel was preached after the resurrection of Jesus? Some people believed, that's true. But it wasn't a guarantee that everybody believed, because clearly not everybody did. And indeed, the resurrection of Jesus wasn't really there as a convincing proof that you ought to believe. It was there as a convincing proof that God had authenticated the death of Jesus, that God had raised him, that God had declared him to be Lord of all, that God had declared him to be his son in righteousness. He was the one who was in the right. Now, that's convincing if you believe it, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessitate that you should believe that. 
So this is raising other questions that are our questions, aren't they? What will convince the obstinate, like Saul of Tarsus? Some rejected the message to start with. They didn't believe it. They, they opposed it, persecuted the people who were preaching it. So what will convince the obstinate and the unbelieving? Now, there are two and a half answers to this. One answer is nothing. For some people, nothing will convince them. We read a little bit from 2 Corinthians in a moment. Uh, we, don't, we, we could try to manipulate people. We could try to trick people. We could try to tell stuff that will try to seduce them, uh, confuse them so that they do believe, but in the end, that doesn't bring them to real faith. The thing that convinces people who get convinced is just what Jesus was doing, that is the word of God, the gospel. Or to say it differently, it's Jesus being revealed to them by God's grace. Jesus, he knew the law and the prophets, but Jesus appeared to him. And some of us would say, yeah, that's what I need, a light from heaven, some shattering. But uh, that wasn't true for everybody. And Paul went around preaching the gospel and there was no lights from heaven, they was just preaching. And some believed it and some didn't believe it. But God revealed himself to the people. And, and uh, I guess talking about lights from heaven, there's other versions of this, aren't there? Like people seeing visions and having dreams. And, and we know that there are Muslims around the world who are seeing visions and dreams. Now, they're not hearing the whole gospel, in the, but they're hearing enough to say, go and read this book, go and talk to this person. When they talk to the person or read the book, then they hear the message. It's the gospel that does it. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that we heard read, here is, here is, here is the, the crucial key to it, I think. So Paul begins 2 Corinthians chapter 4 by saying that we don't lose heart because we've got this ministry, because we could lose heart, because it's so difficult. But in the face of difficulty and opposition, we've renounced secret, shameful ways. We don't use deception. We don't distort the word of God. We don't modify it so people like it. This is chapter 4, verse 2, 2 Corinthians. On the contrary, we just tell the truth plainly. Just tell them what's the case. But verse 3, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are unbelieving, who are perishing, who are heading off to Hades. Because the God of this age has blinded them. See, there's the problem, isn't it? Verse 4, there's something else going on. There's a spiritual problem in the world where the God of this age, the evil one, has blinded people's minds and hearts. It's as though there's a veil over them. How do you get through the veil? How do you penetrate the veil? Well, we don't penetrate the veil. The word of God by the spirit of God, by God's grace, penetrates the veil. And, and so he's here in verse 6, verse 5, we preach Jesus Christ as Lord. That's the simple version. Just who's the Lord. Not ourselves, we don't boost ourselves up, we don't try to promote whatever we're doing, just Jesus. But the way that it works in verse 6 is that God who at the creation said, let light shine out of darkness, light in our hearts. It's the light from heaven, but it's the light for everybody, isn't it? Everyone who comes to hear and to know the gospel, in the end, it's, it's God who shines the light into his heart. And the light is this. He made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. You want to see Christ? You want to see God's glory? There it is in the proclamation of the gospel about Jesus Christ. That's how it works. So what about the Pharisees and the teachers of the law? Back to chapter 15, verse 1, because they're still in the story. This is still part of it. They're, they're in dialogue with Jesus. Actually, they're He's, he's now telling the story to them as much as anyone else. How did Jesus do it? How did he get through to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law? Well, he got through to some, but not all of them. Basically, they have to believe Moses and the prophets. They've got to read the Bible. They've got to read the scriptures. They've got to believe it. Or they're heading for Hades. So what about us and the people that we speak to and we tell the gospel to? How do you know if someone believes it? How do you know if you believe it? Well, there are three things here in this long story we've looked at tonight. Chapter 16, verse 9. Because they use the worldly wealth for their purposes. They use the wealth to care for the poor, like, the, like Lazarus. 
They'll use their worldly wealth so that others will find their way to heaven and that one day you'll come to heaven and there'll be people there who'll welcome you and shake you by the hand, maybe give you a big cheer and a clap and say thank you for what you did with your money because you gave money to the Bible Society and they translated the Bible into my language and I read the Bible in my language and I come to believe in Jesus. Or you paid for a pastor to come and build up our church and tell us the truth. Or you paid for an evangelist. Or, and there'll be others there say, we were really poor. You gave money and we you supplied us to get the water. And you may not get the thing you may not get a gong or an award or a certificate but one day in heaven there will be people lining up and saying thank you for what you did with your money because that helped me that kept me alive kept my kids alive and secondly you'll know if someone believes and whether you believe in chapter 16 verse 14 we're, sorry, we're, back, in, we're back in Luke now trouble with the Pharisees in chapter 16 verse 4 was 14 was that they loved money now that's not the only thing people love but in order to get into the kingdom of God you have to leave them the loves behind that's one of the reasons it's hard to get into the kingdom of God we talked about it the other day about the narrow door you've got to leave the things behind that you love so that you only love Jesus the Pharisees weren't going to get into the kingdom of God while they still loved money. It may not be money that you or I love, but it could be something else. And that's a struggle. I think that's why Jesus says here in chapter 16, verse uh, 16, that uh, everyone's forcing their way into it. Not, against, not in the sense that they're forcing their way against opposition. They're forcing their way because it's just really difficult to get from their own point of view. And the third thing, of course, is that people will come to believe and know that they believe, and you know that you believe, if they join in Jesus seeking and saving the lost. We're back to chapter 15, verse 1, which in some ways sets the theme for these whole two chapters. He's talking to tax collectors and sinners that they will come to repentance and they'll be rejoicing in heaven. And maybe that's the case for the five brothers and the Pharisees and tax collectors, that Jesus is still talking to them, whether directly or indirectly. They're part of the conversation with the disciples. Will they join the party? Will they come eventually like Saul of Tarsus did and become Paul the Apostle? Will they be people who keep on sharing this gospel that brings the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ? to people so that they too can repent how shall we do it how do you do it you've got to talk haven't you talking 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 you don't convey the gospel unless you talk and you've got to talk the gospel of course not just anything people who've given up their loves and just love Jesus and the people who know what they're doing with their wealth and they're using it, wasting it, they've got their money together and they've given up their love for the sake of the And that old little argument and dichotomy between are you doing something or are you saying something, that, there's, that's, that isn't there. And you've given up your loves and you're in the party, then it's just part of one thing. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you sent the Lord Jesus into the world to save that he did it by his death, but the message of what he did is conveyed in words, not to manipulate, not to trick, not to deceive, but just plain, simple declaration of the Lordship of Jesus and the love of God. And we pray that you'll help us to be people who speak it, who live it. You'll help us to be people who use the money you've given us properly and whatever other wealth we've got.
keep on showing us in our lives the things that we love that we ought not to be loving. We pray it in Jesus' name.